Yo, I gotta tell you something. It's like your life is slowing down, but there's something within you. Nothing can offend you when you speak bold with sound. There'll be a moment for change, and I know that you know it's now. And every time you flow, I notice how you control the crowd. Be not the average kid with adjectives. I say you were pro with nouns, but I'll tell you what. Never let your head swell up, because you'll be time when you're broken down. And a lot of people hope it's now. You need to focus, pal. Keep your head up. Just because you're fed up when you're grieving, don't let that be the reason that you let up. Because a lot of people get lifted wishing they were gifted. And I know there doesn't seem to be any reasoning why your mind is twisted, but you ain't right right in the night. See, I can see the line shifting. Life is hard. It makes you want to go sadistic. When you see the vivid statistics of existence, it has nothing to do with physics. When you lost control and you want to go ballistic, you're on the brink of insanity. So think with quickness. You've gotten into this because of addictiveness. So go show the people how sick it gets. Purity would never be different. If it's short, it's reach, trying to be something more than magnificent. And without giving an ish, I'm still living it. My flow can leave you shivering, depend on the way to deliver it. But try to make them start crying to see if they're really into it. You took your life as scribble riddles and in your freaking fourth grade teacher said you passed messed up a little bit so they chose to give you a fourth dose of riddling but in their eyes they were ignorant made you believe that you were supposed to be innocent so you could see at an early age it was something they didn't like in you it was the fight in you that was strange and of need of change but they can never see the pain and never bother to listen and just let me explain so by now it has to be evident that I meant to repent but only talk to God at my residence and always saying that our father at the end of it the alpha and omega can never be used as evidence even if you gathered up the most intelligent the thoughts combined Mind won't even scratch the surface of being relevant. Welcome to Dead Air Live. Tonight, we're going to be talking about tough times for teens. That was terrific, Greg. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we, we are very fortunate to have with us tonight uh, psychotherapist Joanne Zelkin, and we're going to talk about many, many different issues. Yes, we are about teens, parents, and it's not all negative. There are a mm -hmm. lot of positive aspects. So, Joanne. Where would you like to begin? Well, welcome everybody, and freedom of speech, right? Right, So right. whatever you guys want to say or talk about is absolutely fine with me. And, well, I guess one of the first questions is, yeah. what's, what's some of the issues that are really mm -hmm. troubling teens today? Because I know that you've been working in the industry as a psychotherapist right. for 25 years. Right. You've had a lot of success. Right. And over the 25 years, it's the same thing, and, and it seems like most kids are dealing with some form of depression. But why are kids depressed today when there's so much out there, there's so much opportunity? Right. I mean, I look at these vibrant, beautiful faces, and all these kids, none of these kids look depressed. No, nope, they don't, but you have to deal with age and puberty and hormones and parents and family and rules and independence and wanting to belong to the right clique and wanting people to like you and wanting to look a certain way and people not letting you look that way and I mean just the way you were rapping it's just oh, there's a lot of anger a lot of frustration teachers not understanding adults not I, adults don't get kids they don't get kids and that leaves the kids feeling really depressed and confused and, and lonely so if adults don't get kids how are kids supposed to get the adults? Like I was telling some of the kids earlier that when I'm with my nephews and nieces, I don't like to be the person that disciplines. Mm -hmm. I want to be, fun. I'm the fun aunt. Right, right. But, um, but I also noticed that my nieces and nephews, they have a great time with their parents. And I noticed that you, I was watching and observing you a couple of months ago with your son mm -hmm. and the way you were talking to him. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's really wonderful is that you don't talk down at him right you don't you you don't talk at him you talk to him right with him right, right. and maybe that's one of the things that parents are doing with the kids is they'll say you got to do this and you got to do that well, pretty much and I, I a lot of parents come into my practice and say kids don't need a friend they need a parent and I strongly disagree with that do I, you? I, absolutely because I, I think you can have a combination of both small kids need a parent to teach them not to cross the street in traffic, that kind of thing. But teenagers need a friend, and they need a friend in the parent. They need a combination oh, of the two. And a mind. lot of parents, that's the end of that interview, and they walk out. That it, 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 Where I get success with the kids I work with is being, like you said, like an equal. If I'm going to parent the kids in my practice, I'm going to lose them, because they get that too much at home and too much at school. So I think parents have to find a way to be friends with their kids, to like their kids, have their kids like them, to be friends with their kids, to be open with the kids about mm -hmm. what it's like. 
I just think adults forget what it's like to be a teenager. I think we forget. And I'm fortunate enough to work with teens. I think it's the best job in the world, but it reminds me of what it is to be a teenager. You know, most of your parents and teachers and the adults around you grow up and they forget. They just forget what it's like and what's involved in the angst and all of that. So I think there could be a combination of a parent and a friend and a parent with a teen. Is there something that teens can do to put their parents at ease? Because I think that teens are have an advantage point over the parents because the parents are more rigid mm -hmm. and they're set in stone, mm -hmm. whereas there's more flexibility with the teens. Mm -hmm. Is there something that if a parent is getting all like angst out mm -hmm. and a teenager is saying, well, geez, you know, I know how to calm my parents down. Mm -hmm. Is there something that they can do mm -hmm. To bring their parents down, like for it, like like for, yeah, for example, I, I don't think it's a kid's job to bring a parent down. You don't, you don't Absolutely think so. Absolutely not. I mean, for, for no. instance, a parent can be screaming at the kid, mm -hmm. and the kid might say to their parents, "Oh, okay," and be very neutral. Mm -hmm. But if the kid snaps back at the parent, mm -hmm. it's going to keep it going. I think the kid can walk out of that situation. They can. But yeah, leave the room if a parent is, if anybody's being unrealistic or irrational or unruly. But I think it's up to the parent to do the de-escalating of the argument, not the kid. Yeah, but maybe the parents are stuck. They are. That's the problem. But and they, and they send the kids to me, but they're not coming in themselves to do the work. It's, it's very frustrating. So very frustrating. Okay, so how do we fix this problem? Because that's why you're here. Yeah, I don't know, Toto. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew I wouldn't be here, I would be retired on some island somewhere. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but I do think you, we talk so much about teen empowerment, which is here, and teen outreach. I think we need to have parent outreach. I think we need to have teacher outreach, and adult outreach is so, so important. Well, I noticed that there are different groups here. There's teen empowerment. Dan McLaughlin, thank you for being here with some of your, you know, young people that you brought. Organizers. Say it, say it again? The youth organizers. That's right, the youth organizers, yes, and we have the 21st Century, we have the uh, Boys and Girls Club, or the Kids Club, and uh, am I missing anyone? Uh, we have uh, Save Our Summer Booth, and uh, the Mystic Learning Center, and uh, the Youth Council. These wow. guys represent two different agencies each. Two different mm -hmm. agencies. Yeah. It's, it's excellent, and you, and you are a coordinator where you, where you I, what does teen empowerment uh, do? Well, I'm a program coordinator for Teen Empowerment here in Somerville. We're located on Pearl Street, and what Teen Empowerment does is we promote social and positive change in the community, and we do that through uh, working with youth. We uh, interview about 150 to 200 youth every September, and we only hire about 12 of them. So we hire 12 key kids who know the issues, are real with the issues, and are willing to speak out on the issues. Greg's one of those uh, talented individuals, and they get hired, and we hire some real talented kids and they express themselves in the issues. They talk about the issues and the things going on in Somerville through their raps, through their speeches, poems, spoken words. We hold different events, like we have the Somerville Peace Conference coming up April 12th, which is our, that's our big year around event. Where is our it peace about 500 people? 500 plus, we were bigger than the Boston Peace Conference last year. And it's all Somerville kids uh, talking about Somerville issues, talking about things like depression, adolescence, mm -hmm. all the way to drug abuse, all over the place. And, uh, really connect those to what's going on in the streets too. So it's, it's a real powerful organization. We uh, do a lot here in Somerville. Do you think that right. there's more depression now than there was? Because doctors are giving kids lots of... Yeah, it's they, crazy. They, they're giving them drugs. Yeah, I know. They're I giving mean, them adult drugs. It's I mean, crazy. What? I don't understand. I heard that about the fourth grade teacher in Ritalin. It's so true. And some of the kids in my practice will go into a psychiatrist or even a family doctor who means well and after 20 minutes walk out with a prescription of 100 Prozac and come into my office and tell me they feel suicidal. It's crazy, it's crazy. And I, I, I think medication really needs to be a last resort, not a first resort right. in any of these situations. There's so much, I, if we had programs like yours all over the place, boy, these kids would have a fighting chance. We just don't have enough of this stuff. But you know, I was noticing that all the young people that are here tonight, I have to say that you all have your own different look, your your own identity, but you're all very clean. You have good hygiene. And I know you, you're laughing, but but think about it. it. It doesn't make any difference what you look like, what color your hair is, but if you have good hygiene, 
it shows that you respect yourself. Mm -hmm. And when you respect yourself, you respect other people. I'm sure you've been around people, they don't care, they don't bathe, they don't wash their hair, they just don't care. And I know that I could see that look in your face because you, you know, like you may know somebody like that. And is, is it again? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but it's, it's, and you look like you all really respect and love yourself. Isn't that what it's all about? Yeah, I mean, I think the group here is pretty unusual. I, I don't know you guys. But just <laughs> the fact that you're here, the fact that you're, you're smiling and willing to talk about this, the fact that you're involved in the community, this is much more, this is not the majority of the kids out there. This right. is a very elite group right. that if, if all the kids were this together, I would be out of business. This is not what I'm seeing. It. These kids don't come to see me. I, I kind of have a different type of kid that but, ends up in my practice. But I'm sure some of these kids have issues. Dan, you want to say yeah. something? Well, I mean, uh, it's, I'm, you're right on what you're saying, but also it's, that's all on the surface. Like, uh, looking at me, I can come off as a happy-go-lucky guy, but at home, I might cry. You know right. what I mean? I might be home every day thinking about suicide. Right. You know I mean? That's not mm -hmm. me, but I know a lot of people who come off as happy. And they can sit here in the room, and they can sit and be involved, and they can help, and they can care. And then, but when it comes down to it, they don't care about themselves. And they can be the kid at the Catholic school wearing a preppy shirt, mm -hmm. all dressed up, most popular kid in the school. But when he goes home at night, he doesn't like himself. And he doesn't like the life he lives or whatnot. And so I think a lot of it, that's a problem here in some of us, that the underlying depression, you think because a kid is dressed nice or that because they come from a good home that they might not suffer from depression or, I mean, depression does not discriminate. It, mm -hmm. it does not mm -hmm. see any boundaries and it mm -hmm. affects black homes, white homes, Latino mm -hmm. homes. It, it doesn't matter. So, I mean, it, it's really hard to judge, like, even just looking at this yeah. room, it, it could be if you, you talk to one of these kids for a moment, there might be actually a lot more than just on the surface, too. I, I'm not saying that in a mm -hmm. in, no, you're absolutely like, right. disrespect to anything you guys have said, but mm -hmm. right. it's just that there's so many kids that I know who come off as like happy go lucky, great life, mm -hmm. and then right. in the bottom line is then that kid, I know people who are suicided who have mm -hmm. been, I thought their life was okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's, it's really tough, you so know, just to judge. Why mm -hmm. are kids getting depressed today? Does anyone have an answer for that? Why are kids getting more depressed? I mean, it's, more prevalent. Well, probably parents don't think you can, you're not ready to do something when you really, when really they don't know what you're thinking. They don't know what you're capable mm -hmm. of. You just, you gotta, you, just, you have to try and convince them that you're ready to do this. You, like, some parents don't want teenagers driving cars. They, they feel, they just don't want their kid to grow up. They, they're not ready for that. Mm -hmm. Right, the parents aren't ready. Parents Especially if it's their firstborn, they don't, they care so much about them that they just, I mean, it's just TV, but I saw an F, I, I saw a TV show where there, there was this guy who didn't, who taught this girl the wrong thing, the wrong way to drive, just because he wasn't ready to let his daughter grow up. Wow, that's intense. So parents are reflecting what they're feeling and putting it off in their kids. And they just, they take their life and think that if their life was miserable, they should make their child miserable. I see a lot of that. Well, people usually do reflect. Right. If someone comes up and says, oh, you look awful. Mm -hmm. Well, they're usually feeling that about themselves. That's right. Greg? Yeah. Well, no, I was just going to say that a lot of probably uh, the youth in some will feel that they're depressed because it's just like there's no hope. You know, I mean, we go to some of them high, we go to our guidance counselor for advice, like, oh, what do you think I should do? And then they're the ones who are telling us, like, you don't have enough good grades to get into the school, yeah. instead of telling program. us what we should do to yeah. be getting that type of position to be going to that school. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I see that, and I, I work in a different part. I work with Newton, and I work with uh, Wellesley. Uh, uh, yeah, the guidance department's there, huh? I, no. <laughs> I see the same thing. They, they, it's so competitive, and they try so. And the parents are behind this, wanting these kids to be in these very, very big colleges, and these kids can't keep up. And they'll go into the guidance counselor and say, "Do I? Can I get into Harvard?" And the guidance counselor will say, "Not on your life, buddy." And they'll go home and they'll smoke some crap that night. What That's should, what I see. In my what practice. should the guidance counselor say? I don't think it should begin with the guy. I think it should begin at home. I think parents need to but, figure out who these kids are, sure. what these kids want, and then help these kids figure it out. 
if Greg were in one of the families I work with in Newton and you said, hey mom, hey dad, I want to be a rapper, they absolutely would never promote that. That's, that's what's out there. That, and, and it's not to say all parents are like that. But I, I think particularly in this area, in the Boston, Somerville, there's so many great schools here. It's so competitive. Parents want their kids to be a certain way, to do a certain thing. And if, like you were saying, if the kids veer from that at all, the parents fall apart. They then go to the guidance counselors or the family therapists, and they want us to make the kids do what they want to right. do. And it, it's just a vicious cycle. Steve? Um, well, one of the problems that's in Somerville, as you said, like the parents want them to go to Harvard or any of those nice schools. One of the problems with us is that we're underestimated. Absolutely. Like, we go to our parents, say, they, we can't afford to send you to Harvard. The mm -hmm. guidance counselor says, you're not smart enough. You're, A guidance you're, counselor will yes. say that to you? They'll yes. tell you you're not smart enough? Yes. Instead uh, of finding something good with you, would say, good. listen, no. might I make a suggestion? I've seen you do this. No, I've and, and seen guidance counselors do this. You're kidding. They, they, there's very, well, there's very low expectations. Yeah. Which is, I mean, one of the, one like the stepping, some will hide is like the stepping stone to Bunker Hill Community College right. rather than right. Harvard. Right. Like, right. it's like Bunker Hill Community College phase one, phase two. You're but Bunker Hill there. Community College is not a bad college. Well, not if, if, but if you're going there as like your only option. Right, because that's what you've been told. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. What should the guidance counselor say to you? Let's say your grades aren't right. What would be your expectations of the guidance counselor? What would the guidance counselor say to you that would bring out the very best in you? Well, uh, I've gone to, I've been to the guidance counselor where they told me my grades aren't good enough and that basically they told me to just like kind of coast through the next year mm -hmm. rather than try to bring my grades up. Coast? To, through yes. the next year? Oh. But in that case, it was four years. But. Yeah. Get through. Just get through. Just I, I, I got to tell you, I'm just, I'm totally blown away what you're telling me. I mean, that is like so, um, before, if you're not through, I know Alicia has something to say, but what would you, what would you want the guidance counselor to say to you? Uh, well, rather To than, bring out the best in you. Uh, well, just tell me what I can do mm -hmm. rather than what would be easy to do. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, some of it isn't exactly a place full of rogue scholars, but um, But there but, is a lot of rogue scholars in Somerville. There's a lot of talented people and they don't see that, they just right. see another manual laborer, which is fine. Have That's you what found you what you're looking for in Somerville? Have you found the answer? Well, another problem is that uh, even things that like I want to do, like there are things I want to do, but I also can't see myself leaving here because mm -hmm. this is where like my entire life is. And it's I not a, a bad thing, you know. But, however, if you want to be somewhere else, go for it. Well, that's what the guidance counselor should say. I, I go have kids, for it. I have kids on the other end who come <laughs> in and say, if I don't get into Harvard, my parents are going to kill me. And the guidance counselor saying to them, you don't have the grades to get into Harvard. Let's be real here. And then you watch the parents and the guidance counselors figure out ways to get this kid into the place he doesn't want to even be at. In a, the bottom line is we're not listening to these kids. No. They know what they want. We That's can learn we so much from them. And we're not listening to them. It's right. a big problem. Alicia? Um, I just, there's this, this standard for like me and some of my friends. It's up here and we're thinking down a little bit lower. We're like, you know, I'll get into this school and I'm good here. I'm not even going to try to apply to Harvard or MIT or any of those things because I'm not sure I'm going to get in. And it's because... You know, people around us are telling us that I went to a dinner um, with my boyfriend at his school. He goes to, to uh, you know, a private school, and mm -hmm. it's, they, one of his friend, his parents' friends, they asked me what school I went to, and I was like, oh yes, I go to Ridge, and they just kind of were like, oh, and it just kind of, I'm not the kind of person to take that horribly offensive. I don't really care that much, but it was just kind of like. That's kind of rude. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's rude. What is up with that? It doesn't make any difference where you are, because where you are is exactly where you're supposed to be. And, you know, I have a children's TV show, and the people, we call the people that tell you that you can't do things, negative no-nos. We don't listen to those people. Those are the people that say you can't do it, you're not good enough, you're stupid. I tell those people, you know what, I can do whatever I want to do. No one's going to slow me down. If you feel you have it inside of you, go for it. 
Greg, you had something to say? No, I was just uh, listening to what like Steve said. Like, yeah, and like what you're saying. Um, like, you go to your guidance counselor, and they're just they're not like saying like enough things to where you should be going. They should be focusing on like what you're good at and what you've been doing and what you've done in the past, and like right. stick with it if that's what you're good at. Mm -hmm. And another thing, um, like if adults keep forcing something on like a kid, like oh you have to do this, yeah, they're not gonna do it. No. They're gonna nope. find something else Absolutely. that they want to do. Absolutely, I've had more people, more kids run away the day after graduation from high school Are you kidding? than any other time of the year because they're being forced into doing something they don't want to do and they take off. Where do they go? Different places. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not wow. supposed to know that. Different places just to, just to make a point. Or I see a lot of pregnancy right after high school because they've been set up to do something they don't feel like they really want to do it. And so they can have a baby. And, I mean, it, there's just so many scenarios. See, see the thing is, is that I think that a lot of kids feel like they have the feeling that they're not worthy. Mm -hmm. And I know what it's like to be sad. I even know what it's like to be depressed. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I used to wake up a lot of mornings and I was a miserable person. People did not want to be around me. Mm -hmm. So I consciously one day woke up and I said, every day I wake up, I am going to choose to be incredibly happy. And I just like shifted everything. Mm -hmm. and so I was talking to the cameraman tonight, Mike. Mike call him. Mike says, every time you see me, you say, hey, Mike. <laughs> because I get excited when I see people. Mm -hmm. And so I choose to be like that. And once you start doing something and you create that mindset, mm -hmm. it becomes a habit. For some. Not, for every, not everybody can do that. You don't think so? No. <laughs> no. And I think if you're talking about serious depression, or adolescent depression, absolutely. Yeah. You can't just wake up and say, I want to be happy today. You feel what you feel. Mm. That, that so maybe I live in a bubble. No, it works for you, Joe. It's great. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work for most people. Right. You know, right. I think you're right. There's got to be some positiveness, and you've got resources, mm -hmm. and you've got support systems in place. Sure. The kids don't sure. necessarily have that. Sure. So um, what are some of the issues that are going on with you guys? Do any of you guys have do you deal with depression or what are some of the things that are going on? I find myself like distancing myself. But usually I'm a very social person. I'm always, you know, the center of attention, always in everybody's face just because that's just how I am. But every once in a while I just I don't know, I wake up in the morning and it's like I don't want to talk to anyone today and I'll put on my music and if a teacher talks to me at school I'm just like rolling my eyes at them telling everybody to go away I'll eat lunch by myself somewhere and you know my my real friends like obviously they're like oh that's just Alicia's not having a good day today but some other people they're like what's wrong with Alicia why is she talking why is she being so mean and I'll just like blow everybody off and my mom hates it because she thinks I'm taking it out on her when I'm really not but it's just sometimes I just need my time. I wake up and I don't even know why I'm mad. I'll just be mad about something and anybody who comes across my path is just destruction and it's just sometimes people just need to that's right. give me I, some space. Right. <laughs> and I think that's, that's right. normal. Isn't that normal? It is but people will react to that. People who know you are going to accept that. But like I said, my mom reacts to that and people will be, what's the matter? Will you smile? Be happy? What's yeah, instead of just saying, everybody needs their space. Yeah, Kids everyone need their does. space. And they don't, you can't have your space that easily. You're in school, belongs to somebody else. Your parents' house belongs to your parents. Your friend's house, but I mean, there's just not physically even a place to go. I think that's why kids love getting their licenses so much. That's why I loved it. Oh, because of the freedom. You get in the car and you close the oh. door and you're done, baby. You're there. <laughs> you know, there's nothing better. And, and that's freedom and a, and a place to be. Definitely. I see Verly nodding his head. Yeah, I think that's kind of true because like most parents, they don't really communicate that much with the children. Mm -hmm. I mean, like when they have these kind of day, day, days, like especially after like an argument, <clears throat> the kid might just need some time to like think, think like things over and all that. But the parents might just be thinking like, oh, she's still she or he's still mad at me and stuff like that, that's and right. they trying to like backfire at the kid. And like that's mostly when like things get out of hand, like in life mostly. Absolutely, that's when it escalates instead of just letting the kids kind of sit back and do their own thing. Right. Jetsine, you just joined us. So um, do you have any things that you want to talk about tonight? Nothing? Yeah. Not yet. OK. Uh, Alex. Um, like she was saying, my, my mother kind of does the same thing to me. Like, 
I'll wake up and she'll say, she'll think I'm taking everything out on her from what happened last night, or she'll think it's from something else. But really, she's just the one that's really being cranky. I'll just wake up. I'm, I'm used to waking up. I'm used to waking up and doing my own thing, getting ready, going to school. I'm used to going on a bus and going to school because I lived in a I lived in a town, not a city before. Right in New Hampshire. Yeah. Right. So I'm used to a whole different lifestyle, but I have to change, and so does my mother now that she has three kids living in the house. Mm -hmm. And. I'm not going to say why, but I moved out of my dad's house for a reason. I don't want whatever was happening in my dad's house to become the same issue in my mother's house. It's mm -hmm. scary. Otherwise, I'll have nowhere to go. I, you sound very mature. My, um, my mother isn't very good without her coffee in the morning, and she doesn't have... A lot of us aren't! <laughs> my mother doesn't seem to drink her coffee in the morning. She seems to drink it more in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless she's drinking it at work after I go to school, I don't know. But right. Maybe you can slip it to her without her yeah. knowing it. In her milk. I'm used to, I'm I'm used to waking up by my alarm clock, but I'm trying to um after all, like I'm not used to also having two Wednesdays a month off of school. I mean like half days. Two Wednesdays every month. I'm used to going to school and just not always that I'm just not used to a lot of things around here, I'm, and everybody just takes it out on me because I'm trying to fit in with everybody else. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be a cause for feeling pretty lousy. Absolutely. Dan. Uh, no, I was going to say, I think uh, one of the issues going on in Somerville and uh, all around is like the disconnect between the issues that parents faced when they were teenagers mm -hmm. and youth face now, because I'm, I'm less than 10 years older than most of the youth I work with. And, I graduated from Somerville High where most of my youth went. I graduated in 2001, it's only 2008, and the issues up there from when I went up there with Oxycontin and suicide are different now. Like the Oxycontin doesn't exist up the high school anymore. And that was something that was huge when I was up the high school. But the kids now, I think what happens is this generational thing that, well this generation doesn't, these guys don't have it as hot as my guys. And the guys above me say the same thing about my generation that, oh, well, you know, you guys don't, didn't have, especially with Summable and all the negative stigma that comes with Summable as slumable and scummable as its negative and past. Scummable? Summable has a very negative past. Very negative past. And it's moving towards a bright future. And I love the future that Summable's heading in. Good. But love to hear that. The problem with it, though, is that we have this generation where so the guys older than me say, well, you didn't have as high as us because you didn't grow up with all like the slumable stuff going on which, you know, I got a little bit less than they did. And yeah, that's maybe a, this- That's a bunch of crap. But, well, I, I got finished. So, uh, so then lots of people say that to the younger kids now, but the thing is, the kids now, what most people don't understand, are dealing with more than we had to. Absolutely. I lost my first friend for, from a drug overdose the year I graduated, the year after I graduated high school, 2001. There were kids up the high school still dealing with that. The kids now, they have kids dying of drug overdoses, suicides, drowning, whatever it may be, while they're in high school. Now, I got, I was fortunate enough, or unfortunate enough, that that happened to me after high school, but these kids are dealing with it in school, mm -hmm. and people want to say to them, you don't have it as high as we do, when they do. Right. These kids have it just as high, if not higher, than any other generation. Dan, Dan you're it. right. I think yeah. you, it, there it is, is a, a lot There is a big disconnect between the adults and the, and the youth. Enough. And one thing that ends up happening, too, is a lot of the adults have been through what the youth have been through, and don't say that. And one of the reasons I have the kind of success I do with kids is I was a runaway at 15. I was very involved with drugs by the time I was 16. I had, I had a pretty checkered past and I let the kids know that. So when they come in and they talk about stuff, been there, done that, been around the block more than you, and that really helps. The, oh, yeah. pa the parents don't talk to their kids honestly about their own checkered past, or their own troubled past or whatever. And so there's a, a huge disconnect. Yeah, that's a problem. It's, it's a huge, huge should, problem. Should the parents talk to their kids, I've done drugs, I've, yeah. I've been this, and just yeah. so, so that the kids will probably feel like the parent's human? Yeah, Do you absolutely. guys want to this, hear this from your parents? The yeah. Par no, I was uh, just going to say, like, uh, like, obviously everybody knows when, like, your parent tells you not to do something, like, so many times, it's just like, okay like that's obviously just gonna make me want to do it right. right so like in school when you're like right. growing up and they're kind of telling you like oh drugs is bad like don't do it 
like but they never explain like the cause or like the aftermath of like what happens after that they should have said to you well when i was young i did this and this is what happened yeah you want them to tell you this Yeah. yeah yes that's what i do and i educate about the chemistry of drugs and the physiology of drugs and I have a patient of mine who came in when she was 14 and she was experimenting with LSD. She's 33 years old now and she's called me the other day and said, I got to thank you, Joe, because after talking to you and learning the whole history of LSD, what it does to your mind, what it does to your body, I never did LSD. That was just a great approach. And now I'm having kids myself and I want to use that approach. So it's the same thing with sex. If kids come in, you know, Tell a kid not to have sex. That's that's you. It's such a waste of time. And why so would you what, tell them so that what, anyways? What do you right. say? <laughs> I don't tell anybody not to do anything. Right. But I do talk about AIDS and I do talk about um, uh, STDs Preg- and pregnancy mm-hmm. and getting tested and where to get tests right. and where to get condoms for free. And I hand out condoms if mm-hmm. needed. And I have connections over at Planned Parenthood. That kind of thing because. And the kids tend to come in and say, you know, I thought a lot about it. I think I'm going to wait, or I think we're going to get tested first. Or it has a huge success. If a kid comes in and says, you know, I'm thinking about sleeping with my boyfriend, and you say, oh, no, bad, don't. I mean, they're going to they're gonna do it. That <laughs> night, that hour, that second, you know, they're going to leave and, and go. Yes. Instead absolutely. of just educating and saying, you can do it, but how are you going to feel? Blah, 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 right. blah, blah. Um, yeah. Alex, you have something, and then Alicia? Um, well, I'm back to the point of, like, parents not talking the way they should. I think that um, parents are ashamed of their past. They don't yes. They don't want their child to repeat their life. You're absolutely right. Well, you are smart. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but the best way they, to help a child not repeat it is to educate. Right. So you got to tell them what you did. Yeah. What you did wrong. Yeah. So they don't do the same thing. Yeah. If you If you don't want them to repeat your life, stop making them do things and tell them why not to do things instead of... That's right. So you don't want to be preached to. I don't like being told what to do. No, I don't either. No. Nobody does. I flip out if I'm told what to do. I I mean, if you're doing it in a nice way and just asking Mm. me to do something, I don't care. If I'm not listening to you, go ahead and yell at me, but you know. I don't don't, don't like being yelled at for no apparent reason. No one does. It's not necessary. No one does. No. No one does. Alicia? Actually, me and my mother, it's just us two in the house, so I really like the relationship we have. We're almost like sisters, best friends sometimes. I mean, obviously she has to step in and be a parent every once in a while, but we really have a connection. And, you know, when she went to high school, she didn't go to Ridge, but she, her boyfriends, whatever, were in Ridge, so they were all around that area, and she hung out with the gay crowds and did all that other stuff, and she, she tells me that, and although she did it, like, a couple of years ago, which all of a sudden I just found out all this stuff, I was like, oh, okay, Mom, you're a little off, but... <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 but you but feel it, good that she... It brings us it. together on a closer right. level, right. and we can connect more, so, you know, obviously when I get really mad and she's like, oh, Alicia... You can't do that because I'm such. I'm like, you know, mom, you're not me. You're not going through this. I mean, I already, you know, it depends on how the situation was. I turn around so many times and I'm like, well, you know, you did this, this, and this. You told me you did this, this, this. It's not the same way for me. That's right. But we have that kind of relationship where I feel comfortable talking to her about the stuff. So it keeps me from doing other stuff. Like she'll tell me, you know, don't smoke, don't do drugs. And I don't think I probably would have in the first place, but you know, she tells me I had friends. There were friends that I lost this, this, and mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. really lay it down. And it's different when it comes from your parent or somebody you really know learning about something that then like a school assembly about right. the violence and the whatnot. It's just kind of, oh, okay. There's more well, impact. Thanks for the announcement. Like I haven't heard that a million times. But when it comes from your mother who, you know, went through this stuff already, it's kind of like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I should listen. <laughs> and it's less, it for me, I don't know about other people. I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but it causes me less to think, oh, well, let me go do this anyways because you told me not to. Yeah, that doesn't uh-huh. work. No, <laughs> it, does, it doesn't. It doesn't work. Verly? Mm-hmm. One other thing is that, like, <clears throat> I strongly agree with, like, what Alicia said because, like, parents need to have, like, this kind of relationship with their children. For example, like, my dad, we live together, just me and him. Like, I don't really call him dad anymore because I see him, like, as a... What do you as, like, call him? I call him his name, which is Gabriel. 
I mean, like, <laughs> just like the connection we have, like the relationship we have mm-hmm. together. Like, I see him like as my best friend. Like anything I have, I just cannot. Get, like, great. I just can like go to him and talk about it. Like, basically, like you can just go to your friend and talk about something. But like the mature mind that they have is just like what sometimes you need in life. Like you need a more mature life, right. not just like somebody in your same like age group and stuff like that. I mean, like they have more experience than us. It, I mean, like, it, even though, like, their experience is, like, kind of different than what we went through, right. like, but it's still, like, kind of the same, because, like, what they went through, like, we could, like, if they tell us about it, like, the, in the right way, we could, like, take some experience from it and not try to do what they right. what they did and, like, not, right. not make the same mistake as they did. And the key to that, and it's probably what Alicia's talking about, too, is non-judgmental discussion, freedom of speech which is you can tell me anything you want or need to tell me and you won't get punished for it. Right, that, that's huge. That's really that's huge. big. You won't get grounded for it. Mm. So if you tell me you're in trouble, you tell me you're doing something and I promise you, I am not gonna judge you ever for that or ground you. Guess what? The kids talk to their parents. Right. That So many times the kids come into my practice I don't say anything to my parents. I don't say anything to the neighborhood police. I don't say anything to the rabbi or priest. I don't say anything to my teachers because I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get my friend in trouble. But if there can be more freedom of speech with kids where parents do not punish and reprimand and criticize, that would be huge. You come from a place of love and not power. Yeah, well, see, and yeah, that's right, and that's right. something and that's something that I try to work with in everything that I do. Am I coming from power? Am I coming from love? I want you to really think about what I'm saying there. When you when when you when you react when you talk to someone, a person that comes from power gets all caught up in their ego and yeah. everything else. When yeah. you're coming from a place of kindness and love. You always end up doing the right thing in your yes, practice. Yes. You come from love and yep. kindness, and they trust yep. you. They don't need another bad adult. <laughs> I mean, they yeah, but, don't. But, but parents aren't bad. They're not bad. They, they just you, this, there wasn't a handbook no. for all our parents. No, and to we do these pa- we parent the way we were parented. I make terrible mistakes with my son, and I catch myself sounding like my mother. And it 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 bothers me. But I do something she never did, which is say, "I'm sorry." That's me. I didn't have my coffee this mm. morning. I, I screwed up. Sorry about that. You know, and that's that's really right. an important. I'm not saying I'm perfect at all. Right. But you know that it we have a relationship that I don't see. It sounds like what uh, uh, Alicia's talking about. Alicia and Verly, yeah, yeah, you both have great relationships. relationships. It's great. And that's the key. Um, Alex. Um, no offense to my mother, but um, it is. To keep a relationship with your child, you if you promise them something and you break it a lot of times, whether it's financial difficulties or whatever, if you don't think you're going to be able to keep it, don't say it at all. Just mm-hmm. keep it to yourself until you know that you can keep it. It's Either that point. or just say good, maybe. Good point with <clears throat> everyone. I, I'm, it's not just my mother. It's And I know it's not her fault. But sometimes, I, I, most of the time, I, I have people that tell me, they're going to do something for me. They're going to do something to help me. Mm-hmm. But really, they don't do anything. They just sit there and watch me fail at what I'm trying to accomplish. Well, they don't maybe, they don't understand me. They don't Maybe they're breaking maybe, their promises. Yeah, maybe that should tell you if I guess if a person says they're going to do something for, for you and they don't end up doing like you asked me, when am I going to have the DVD for you? And I said to you a week probably going to be sooner, but I said a week because I know I'm going to get it done. Yeah. If I say sooner, I'm going to mislead you, and then you're going to be disappointed, and you're never going to trust me again. I, I'd rather I, give myself more time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, so if, you s- if someone says they're going to do something and they don't do it, it I guess it's almost like it's a trust issue. It, it, you stop trusting the person. Yeah, well, you, 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 you can't help it. It's them. human nature. Well, well, yeah. Saying that kind of gave me a flashback of myself, I guess. I kind of did the same thing to my parents, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but is, you know, everyone deserves right. a second chance, too. Don't right. you think, Joanne? Absolutely. You can't give up on people. Yeah. Just I, I mean, toss I've, them I've out. had several chances to make up. Like, right now, I'm in a huge feud with my father and my stepmother. It's really... 
and I haven't talked to him on the phone or I, let's just put it this way I haven't seen him in about two two and a half months mm -hmm. we've been talking by email very little but that's because I wasn't willing to give him a second chance for not listening to me and pretty much destroying what I had going there and forcing me to move out. That's why we have a psychotherapist there. <laughs> <laughs> Second chances have to be earned, just like respect. And which, no offense to him, he hasn't earned it in my point of view. They have to be earned. And we don't just respect somebody because they're a parent. And we don't just give a second chance because it's a kid. It's, it's, it goes both ways. It's got to be earned. Yeah, like they, parents have always, are always saying, I deserve respect. I feed you. I give you shelter. You know what? Who cares if you give me shelter? I can go find shelter somewhere else. I don't we, need We didn't you. ask to be born, did we? No. We didn't have a choice. No, we did not. It was your choice to have us, which means yeah. you have to There's shelter us. There's some responsibility us. there. And it's not to say parents are bad. And y you can be a good person and be a bad parent at the same time. I see a lot of really nice people in my practice. They just suck at being parents. They're really bad parents. But they're, they don't mean it's not vicious. It's not, it's not a parent bashing thing. But after all the kids I've seen, I just, it, it is just still shocking to me how little responsibility the adults take and how the blame gets put on the kids. It's, it's, it really bothers me. My father like, says, you need to start showing at least 1% and we'll show you the same back. Every time I do something more, he expects more and says I'm still not showing anything. And he expects me to work on both things, school and home. Which one do you want me to work on? I can't do both at the same time. That's right. Grades. Now I'm getting good grades, but I'm still trying to work on how I act at my house and lying and stuff like that. You, you feel like you can never please them. Yeah. It's like your, your best is never good enough. Right. But at now at my mom's oh. house, I feel that I can do a lot more and I have a lot more self-confidence in what I'm doing. Oh, good. That's the place you should be then. Everybody deserves a little bit of praise. A lot of praise. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. Really? Um, just to get back on the promises thing, um, like I start, um, I kind of agree, agree with, with like what you said, but I think sometimes like when, once you get to be a teenager, you have to have like more understanding. I mean, like if the parents tells you she, he he's gonna buy you like something next week, and you see like during the week something occurs, I mean it, you might not know about it, but it might happen. But like you have to be like able to understand what what what's like going on like in his life. I mean, like he might, he might not be able to. Get, I mean, he might not, he might not want to disappoint you, and, to, right. and tells you that he's not gonna be able right. to get it to you. But like you, as a, like a teenager, you, you have to like try to understand like where he's coming from, like, or, like all of his like responsibilities and all like that. He might not be able to like support everything all at once. You might like trying to give him a little break or something like that. Right. I mean, like see it like see see it like from your own perspective. If you're like in in his place, what would you do? I mean, like, just to see, like... That's very, very the, wise. The, like, mm -hmm. For example, like my dad, he has to send money back in Haiti and stuff like that. But I try not to depend on him as much and all that because I see he, he has, like, a lot of responsibilities. Even if he tells me something, even, like, if he tells me he's going to get me something and he, and he doesn't, I don't get mad at that because I know he has a lot of responsibilities and all that. I'm not the only person on his case. So that's basically what it is. You're very mature. Yep. I, I know, yeah, I know my dad always used to say, if you ever have a problem and you don't know what to do, always put yourself in the other person's shoes and it'll be easy to come up with, right. with an answer. There's a problem when it becomes a power struggle again. It becomes a problem when a parent says to a child, if you do this, I will buy you this DVD player. That's a problem because if the child does it, and the parent says, well, not quite enough, no DVD player. That's where the trust comes in. So favors and gifts and rides and money should not be a, a, a source of a power struggle. Right. Those have to be earned as well. I Great. see where he's coming from, but I mean, like, where I'm, where I'm, what I'm trying to say is like, since when did my parents cut me a break? Why should I cut you a break if you don't cut me a break? Mm -hmm. 
you, you, you got to be a little more flexible too, you know. I mean, if we're going to be flexible with you, you got to mm -hmm. be flexible with us. I agree. Mm -hmm. Just because we're younger doesn't mean you can treat us like crap. That's you right. got to... I think we deserve a little respect too. You absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You have a right to be here. You're important. You're, you're valued. Everything about you is perfect. So never give up on who you are because you do have a right to be here. And our, like... The, um, I thought you said you weren't going to talk tonight. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's what's up with that? I've never been in front of a camera like this before. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, you're doing pretty, <laughs> doing pretty good. I don't know what I'm going to do. Live. <laughs> oh, live. Oh, oh, thanks. thanks. Yeah, that means everyone at home is getting this right now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Anyway, um, what was I saying? I don't know. So when you're finished, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Greg. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> okay. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't mean to embarrass you. Oh, it's fine. Great. Uh, just like uh, going off of what Verily said, what he said, like they do have to be like understanding, like of both sides, and we have to understand where adults are coming from, and they have to understand where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. kind of funny how like certain, like with age, as you get older, you kind of see what's more important and what's more essential in life. Mm -hmm. Like when you're like 11 or 12 or 13 or something like that, like. And the only thing your mind worried about is like, oh, you promised me like that action figure I wanted. But now when you get like a little older, 17 to 18, you mm -hmm. kind of notice like what you need to be doing. So you kind of almost relate with the adults like, hey, you need to send money for this. You need to pay the bills. We barely have food in the house. Mm -hmm. I mean, certain things are essential and like, you know, I mean, wisdom comes with time. So certain people learn certain things like. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Very good. Steve? That's actually pretty much what I was going to say. You're kidding, um, the whole thing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good. <laughs> I mean, it's just like when you're younger, like you don't see like, like when I was when I was little and I would always get angry at my mother. I didn't realize that she was getting frustrated very easily because she worked the night shift. She would work all night, wow. had to sleep all day because when my father died, she had to provide for me and my oh. my three brothers and my sister. Right. So. It was really hard for her, and I didn't really understand that at the time. Uh, but fortunately, I didn't have to because I had three older brothers who would enforce any law she put down. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> With prejudice. <laughs> my, my mother is the same. My mother works from 2.30 to midnight. So she tries, to, she tries to sleep, yeah. Only I'm the oldest in all four families, so mm -hmm. I... I don't enforce anything to my brothers. They don't listen to me. <laughs> Why bother? So but it's about having some compassion, too, for parents and, and to be able to see their side. I, I think it's great. They are showing a lot of compassion. Yes. Are, you, are you done? I'm sorry. Uh, you have something, I mean, the floor is yours. There was something, but it's gone. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Verly? Um, I think also, like, even if the parents might not, when you're, like, a teenager and all that, mm -hmm. they might try to hide, like, their problems and all that. I think you have like to try to work the relationship out, trying to talk to them. Sometimes like they might need money, but they won't ask you for money even if you, even like if they know you have, mm -hmm. you have money. Sometimes like you just gotta see like what's going on in the house, like how how like his reactions are. I mean like sometimes when I work and I get my paycheck and I just give like half to my dad because I know he has a lot of responsibility and he doesn't have to ask me for me to give it to him because I know he needs it. I mean like some some teenagers like have to understand that too. That's basically like one thing like teenagers need to work on. This is a very, very mature group. And there's a flip side of all this too and that is the kids who grew up in very wealthy homes. They say, oh they don't have any problems, they've got it made. Oh no way. Because a lot of these kids are not allowed to work. They're supposed to be home studying and getting ready for that big old Harvard in the sky. That's right. And every time they need a dime, they have to go to the parents and justify why they need the money and what the money's going for. It gets really, really tricky. And then money can become, again, a power struggle. So you can have it on both sides. And a lot I, of expectations. I see more problems on the other side where there's more, too much money involved. Right. And I see much more serious problems. Alicia? I don't want to say like a name because I know my friend would like kill me if she knew what I was talking about. You don't have to mention anyone. But um, I have a friend from school and her parents. You know, she lives in this big house over near Harvard Square, and everybody's always having parties at her house because she has a jacuzzi and a pool, and you know, woo, her house. But her parents are constantly like, you know, you need to do this. Like we have, you know, we have a whole drama department. She's in 
the dance company. She's in the acting mm-hmm. thing. She's doing, you know, all the, the, the productions that we have. Any production that we have, her parents are like, you're starring in that, and there's no say about it. A you lot have of to expectations. Have A's in your, your honors classes, and you need to have the star role. Every show must be perfect. And I went to a parent-teacher thing with my mom, and her parents were there too. And they were talking to the teacher, and the teacher was just like, looking at them like, well, how could you put your daughter through all this stuff? They're talking about how they want her to have, you know, all these A pluses and all this other stuff and everything has to be rolled into one and Mm -hmm. how they don't understand why sometimes she goes around the house and she acts all extra sad and I'm just sitting there thinking well maybe if you didn't push her to the brink of death she wouldn't be so upset absolutely (laughs) absolutely. and she's going to have more problems than you she's going to be more troubled unfortunately because she's she's living a very tough life I don't mean to say that I, I don't have a crystal ball but that's my guess that's my guess too. Yep. Wow. Alex? Oh. Anyone? <laughs> to some of you, Travis, I see you uh, nodding your head. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I see what's going on. It's, in, in my opinion, just over here, what everybody's talking about, it's, it's truly the times. As far as parents not having enough time to talk to the kids, uh, the kids not having enough time to talk to the parents because there's so many expectations. So I think maybe, and that was kind of left up for the kids to go to the parents and say, hey, I need you to talk to me. Mm-hmm. Teach me how to grow up. But, you know, as far as growing mm-hmm. up, you know, um, you just have to, you, nowadays the kids have to grow up a lot quicker. You know, like you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I just think it's the times and it's only going to get worse. It's going to get harder. And you need yeah. that communication. Yeah, and, and, and the kids are feeling more depression is what I've seen over the 25 years. More and more so. It's, and times are tougher. So they need all the support Greg? they can get. Yeah, definitely like times now, as I can see around the city, are definitely getting tougher. I mean, for youth, there's not that many places to go. I mean, they're taking out the bowling alley, the movie theater is gone. Mm. I mean, they're, I guess they're in the work of making a new movie theater, but it's going to be like this huge megaplex for like probably like twelve, fifteen dollars a ticket we're not even right. gonna be able to afford where, to get in. Where do you right. go? You go to the teen empowerment. I mean you have a place that you can gather, correct? It, it, it's not a drop in center though. It, it's yeah. it's oh. an employer. It's they're, they're, they work oh. for us and they, they do work when they're there. Yeah. So yeah. where where do you guys hang out? Yeah. Where do you where do you go? We're, uh, we're always on like the streets, the yeah. corners where yeah. the cops are for doing bad stuff. I mean we can't even go to the park without getting kicked out. Yeah. And really? Like, yes. kinda, and they, kinda, kinda I hear a lot saying, about that. Oh, like he was saying, like stuff is gonna get harder. Oh, yeah. I mean, even if you look at Star Market, like Danny was telling me before, before, like, uh, you know what I mean? The, like our idea of a job when we're 15 and 16, trying to support our family to help out maybe our mom or dad with the bills mm-hmm. is maybe like a bagger or a cashier. Those jobs are now being replaced by robots. You go in there and you place like a credit card in and mm-hmm. like there's nobody standing there anymore. They just took out Star Market at the grocery store on Broadway, and guess what that's gonna be? A police, police station. station. Right. And guess what's oh. right by, uh, on Broadway? The projects are right over there. So uh-huh. you have to think, like. So do you guys, when you hang out together, do you go to each other's homes? I mean, where do you, where do you hang out together? Usually whoever, like. Except our parents aren't home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, or whoever has like the best stuff or bigger house oh. or most room and most private area there is right because right. nowadays right. kids don't like to hang around their parents I know. parents are either too busy with something else they get out of the house go find something to do or so the kids just think that now the parents never <laughs> have time to hang out with them mm-hmm. so they go and do their own things yep. that kind of leads to the drugs or whatever they feel that they're not wanted in the house so they go and do something because they think it makes them feel better. But really, it's just killing them. Yep. Absolutely. When are people going to learn that? I've, I've seen something different in Newton. I've seen the um, drug levels be higher than ever, uh, particularly heroin. And Kids? I see, yeah, yeah, and I see a lot of Oxycontin, and I see a lot oh of goodness. much more serious drugs. 25 years ago, it was pot. It was, you know, Dad's uh, Jim Beam from the liquor cabinet. Now it's just, it's a whole different world. It's very, very different. 
So I'm glad to hear Somerville, you're seeing a lot less. I see much more in Newton. It's improving. It's, it's far from. Boy, could you guys perfect. come and help us out because it is worse. First. It yeah. is <laughs> worse than ever. Well, uh, a, a thing in Somerville, too, is that I mean, I know other communities are experiencing oh. high opiate use and high uh, depression, but young kids in Somerville are dead. Like, they're dead. I know of 17 different kids under the age of 20 over the past five years who have died from overdoses or suicide oh. linked to depression or whatnot. I'm so so it's like other, other communities are, but when it, when it happens in Arlington, it's on the front page of the Globe. Right. When it happens in Somerville, it's right. not it's non existent because because it's supposed to happen here. You know well, it I mean? doesn't happen. No, it doesn't go on the front pages of Newton. It doesn't get on the front pages of Newton because Newton wants to cover it up. Yeah. Because they they want to pretend there's not a problem, so they can keep charging the taxes they do. Yeah. So we, it's it's all for it's the same problem. Yeah. It's the so same problem. One, one thing I, I'd add to that is the fact that we have these pharmaceutical companies pumping off pills to kids, pumping kids full of Klonopins and Xanax, yeah. and you're giving these to kids who are already depressed. You're giving a kid with anxiety problems, anxiety medicine, that's actually making him have more anxiety. More and then, and also, it's, it's driving them loony. Like, these drugs shouldn't yeah. be in kids' hands. Yep. I know kids who, they've taken them, they don't know how to take them. The doctors are just taking them, because the doctors are getting pill, uh, they, they're getting trips for sending these kids up Pill Hill. Yeah. They get money for it, the mm. pharmaceutical company, everyone gets rich and kids die. What should we do? Yeah, absolutely. What should we do? You're asking the wrong person. We should take these companies down. <laughs> I mean, if you're asking me, we should go at we should go at these pharmaceutical companies. At the pharmacy, and also and also the doctors, and, and the also doctors. the psychiatrists yeah. who give a prescription after meeting a kid for 20 minutes who says they're depressed, 100 Prozac, and then they go home and they take the 100 Prozac. That's and there's there's no board to watch any of this, and it it is absolutely criminal. Doctors again, trips for you prescribe a certain amount of Xanax, you fill your quota, and you get a trip to Aruba. That's ridiculous. Doctors are getting trips off people's lives, off people losing their lives. And that is a national problem. That's not a sum of right, the Massachusetts, right, right. Greater Boston problem. That's a national issue. We have a couple more minutes left, so we're going to wrap it up. So I want um, Steve, Alex, you have about 15, 20 seconds. Go. Um, oh, now I don't even know what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> time well, Alex, done. can you um, be quick? Yeah. I know that um, he said that we need to bring those companies down. But instead of bringing them down, why don't we just add more? Why don't we take the people that, um, some more people and add more pharmacists? Say you, instead of just seeing one person after 20 minutes decide on a prescription, after that, if he, say, he doesn't know what to do, you go up to a higher level, just like we have in our court system. You keep going up and up and t uh, um, more Checks powerful. and balances. Yeah. It sounds, yeah. in theory, you yeah. know what? It's, yeah. it's a it's consideration. Yeah. And by the way, we're going, we're going to yeah. have to continue this show, uh, part two, because we <laughs> didn't cover like a lot of stuff. And I hope you guys will join us again when we have our next show in a few months. Okay? Because we have a lot to talk about. And this was a great, yeah. great group. And Joanne. Great. Thank you. Sure. So much for being here tonight. Oh, did you guys anytime. enjoy the topic tonight? Um, was this good? Did, did we did we gather? I think we got some good information. Yeah. yeah. No. And I, I was going to say to Danny and to Greg, have you guys ever thought about going on a political level to make some? Sure. Absolutely. Yes. Start start with the town council, planning committees. Well, actually, uh, Greg's a part. Greg and myself uh, and Steve actually all apart. I, I facilitate and Verley actually. I'm sorry, Verley. Yeah. Uh, these three are on the mayor's youth council, so they're actually That's on where policy. That's it starts. They're, Huge. They're, they're actually on the Good. youth level of policy making Good. in the city. They meet with the mayor once a month. Excellent. They got. They actually we're going to D.C. this weekend.